Alexandra, thank you very much for talking with me on Talk Beliefs. And uh, before we talk about your own involvement in the cult, could you tell us a little bit about your background, what your main drive is as a writer and an educator? Okay, well, thanks for coming and taking the time to talk to me. I appreciate it. Um, I'm currently an associate lecturer at Birkbeck. I basically teach social psychology there where I include a lot of information about cults. Um, I also teach at the Mary Ward Centre and talk, teach about cults and totalitarianism. Um, I write, I try to activate a little bit, I've never yeah. quite gotten over being an activist, um, about prevention, teaching people preventive methods of avoiding cults. Yeah. Um, so there's a variety of ways I try to do that, but it's a difficult task, so I'm still banging on doors trying to get attention. Uh -huh. so. Okay. Uh, you, you yourself were involved in a cult, and now you've written about your experiences and how you escaped in the book Inside Out, a memoir of entering and breaking out of a Minneapolis political cult. Mm -hmm. uh, could you explain to us how you got involved, what it was about, and how you came to realize that you needed to get out? Yeah, in brief, because like many of these stories, it's a long story. Um, in my mid-twenties, you know, well, just to back up a little bit, I was raised very much in a political family. Yeah. We had roots in the anti-apartheid movement and so forth, and uh, trade union movement and so on. So that was kind of my background, was to be an activist about things to do with inequality and injustice. Um, anyway, I wound up in America um, as a youngster and uh, had been an activist in California for some time and then things kind of started to downshift, Reagan got elected and mm. the kind of historical moment changed. Yeah. And I wanted to stay being an activist and a lot of the people I'd been working with sort of were stopping doing that. And I, I had also just broken up with a boyfriend mm -hmm. and this is typical when you've had some normal, what's called a normal life blip just a normal transition in life. That's, but you tend to be a little bit more open to like a like things. a crossroads in your life sort of thing. Yeah, or? I wouldn't even put it quite that strongly, but you know, going to university, having losing a loved one, you know, yeah. either through a breakup or death or whatever, or some kind of stress that changes your uh, kind of, yeah, a little bit of a crossroads. So I had one of those, and then um, Fats met some people who were involved in political work, which I was told, and I think they believed, they were kind of low-level people in this group, was to do with the things I was interested in, agitating for childcare for working women, uh, for better health care, and this was in the US where health care is a big problem, mm. and the kinds of things I had been working on. So I kind of signed up. Um, well, I didn't really sign up, I started getting involved. Yeah. Um, and for me, it was quite a slow process. Some people, it's very quick. It can be within a few days that you get grabbed and hooked into a cult. For me, it was really over, I'd say, about a year because I was sort of long distance away from the group, but starting to work with them in different ways. And I think the piece that really nabbed me and kept me hooked in was I got really after about a year sort of set up with in a kind of arranged relationship mm. with a man right. and I had been single for a bit and you know it was part of my youthful idealism yeah. to be with someone who shared all my values of social justice and all this well here I was kind of offered up this guy who I happened to like um, and I looking back I think that was a lot what kind of kept me in Anyway, so... This was orchestrated in a way. Yes, it was yeah. totally orchestrated. Totally. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So, then I ended up moving to Minneapolis where this group was and living with this guy. And um, after a year or so further, I tried to get out because I started not liking what they were doing. Um, for instance, they were paying some of the workers in one of their projects below minimum wage. And that mm. went against everything, everything I believed in. Yeah. And I sort of tried fighting about it. 
because I didn't yet know that you're not supposed to fight, you're not supposed to disagree with anything. Mm. Um, and I actually kind of left at that point, yeah. but I was now 2,000 miles away from anybody I knew who wasn't in the group. And also I didn't understand it. And I was also in a, you know, I had become in a quite solid relationship with this guy, who I still like. Um, and I was completely isolated. So I was living in a little flat, not knowing anybody. And I wasn't really in touch with my family because as with all cults, I had been highly encouraged to cut off ties with the people I'd been close to formerly. And I sort of went crawling back because I didn't know why, I didn't, I knew I objected to this particular issue, but I didn't understand what all these pressures were that had been put upon me. Um, like isolation, like being made to feel like I wasn't good enough, like they knew better and they had their reasons for everything they did. Yeah. And all this kind of stuff, and you know, no one had ever taught me the warning signs of a dangerous and isolating relationship. I just felt lonely and unhappy, and that there was nowhere else for me to go. So I went back. This is not an uncommon thing that happens to people with cults. They may try to leave. It's like an abusive relationship. And this was a political cult. It wasn't a religious cult. This such. was a so-called left-wing so-called Marxist group, hmm. so which was kind of what I was when before I got in. We didn't really, though, again, much study much of any of that. I, um, and we were supposed to be about all this social justice stuff, but it ended up being really about what, what, what they called the ITP. We were full of acronyms. Everything was an acronym. And the ITP was the Internal Transformation Process. Now, I'd like to issue my first warning to your viewers. Anything with the word transformation in it, mm. run a mile. Because it implies that you're not okay, and you have to transform yourself. Into something else. Not, you know, learn something new, or slight, you know, develop in a certain way. It's yeah. completely shift who you are. Mm. So the Internal Transformation Process was to proletarianize ourselves. Mm. So it used this Marxist language that we were basically bourgeois because the society was bourgeois, which meant we were bad. And the good was to become proletarianized. And to become proletarianized was to do everything you were told to do from up above. Mm. So I'm sure we could easily compare it to a religious cult where, you know, everything you are naturally is, you know, some kind of original sin or, you know, Satan talking in your ear or yeah. whatever the things are. And to become good and, you know, and worldly, you know, the bad is all worldly, isn't it? Then the good you is following all the rules exactly. And so it's very much the in-group versus the out-group. Totally that. We were also secret and underground. Yes. Which... I never did figure out why we were underground because we didn't seem to be doing anything that would qualify to be underground. Many years later, after, and after I got out, I discovered actually the leader had murdered somebody and that may have had something to do with going underground, looking back. Um, but also in those days in America, leftist political groups were being attacked, so there was a kind of a justification for being quiet about your activities. But we weren't really doing anything that anyone would be worried about. Mm. But the purpose of being underground was that it was very isolating. So you couldn't really, you had this elite status. We were doing this special secret work. We couldn't really divulge it to anyone in the outside world. We were in the outside world. We all had regular jobs. And then we came home at night and did a double shift at a cult related job. So mm. we were exhausted. So for 10 years, I was sleep deprived, another sign of a cult. Yeah. Um, so that was, so life went on, eventually how I got out. So it's a, it's a long story, it was 10 years of my life. Um, I got out eventually, I had, I was actually told to have children. And again, cults, that's kind of a universal, the cults control your relationships, they control your sexuality, they control reproduction. 
and they control your family life all in different ways. They all do it in different ways. In ours, it was a particular way. But anyway, I was told to have children. Is that also to perpetuate the, the group by having little cult members, basically? Um, I think there's different cults have different ways and reasons for the control. Yeah. I think the fundamental reason to control is so that to interfere with your normal relationships because your primary relationship has to be to the group and the leader. Yes. Yeah. I think in our group, why did he want us to have children? Not everyone could. I think it was just a way, like one woman who was quite high up wanted children. She wasn't allowed to for quite a long time. So I think it was just a way to yeah. control, and to control her. And for me, I knew I wanted children at some point, but I hadn't really come to that decision yet. So it was a way of controlling me by saying, okay, you will now do this. Do you see what yes. I mean? That's, yeah. But different cults are different. Some forbid you from, you know, Scientology doesn't want the Sea Org, the inner group's members to have children. They have to have forced abortions. The group I studied, the Newman Tendency, made people have abortions. The um, children of God, and well, that's not a good example, the, uh, what are they called? The Dugar family, who are part of this ACT, oh, yes. a lot of these right-wing fundamentals, the Quiverful movement. Oh yes, yes. have as yeah, many They as have to have children. There's, you're not allowed to use contraception. Heaven's Gate, they castrated the men. So they're all controlling it, but in different ways, depending on what the leader is thinking. Yes. Right? So that's kind of how you have to look at it. Is there control? Not necessarily the particular type of control. Mm. So. Anyway, so I had children, and the leader, unknown to me, was in jail for a bit for this murder. Not for very long, only for a year. And so there was a bit of a loosening for a, for a bit. Yeah. And then when he came out, they started tightening up again. So I started getting, me and my husband were, got like a criticism about how we were raising our son. In particular, he was allowed free play. And in particular... They were very cross with, we let him play with Ninja Turtles. Oh, Lord, you know, what a crime. And that set a little light bulb off in my head, which is a funny little thing. Mm. But it was really about, and this happens for some parents, you can control me and tell me it's for my, you know, the revolution and to make the world a better place, but don't you mess with my children. Mm. You know, there's a kind of a... Yeah in my case, maternal protectiveness that kicked in. Now, unfortunately, some people are in such intense cults that that can't even kick in. Mm. Or if it does, they don't have power to stop the abuse of their children. Not yeah. that it was abuse, but it was control. So that set a light bulb off in my head. The other thing that happened um, was that one of the other people in the cult we were all getting really fed up. We'd been in it for 10 years, you know, and some much longer than me. And me and her, in this little slight opening period, just started testing each other out to see if we could trust talking to the other person about our doubts. And eventually we kind of very gently started approaching each other and finally said, do you think there's something wrong here? And we didn't know what it was, but we called it, eventually when we did talk about it, which you really weren't supposed to, that was a big crime. We called it power problems. We said there were power problems in the group. And the power problem was with the leader. And so we had what I call in my next book, we formed a little island of resistance. Because normally in a cult, you can't share doubts. That's like the worst crime, is to share doubts with someone else in the group. Yeah. But we broke that and we shared doubts and we fought. Was there any fear that, that because in some cults I know that uh, they're encouraged to snitch on others. Oh yeah, but so we were you afraid built of that? trust. Late, we built enough trust we didn't fear that. But later, anyway there's another reason but I won't go into that because the other thing is a long story as well. So anyway, we then planned our way out very carefully. We both had children. Hmm. Uh, she also, her husband, she did trust and he came into this little island of resistance. I tried talking to my husband and he wouldn't have anything to, he, I didn't tell him exactly what we were doing, but I was talking about doubts and he couldn't go there at the time. Mm. So we very carefully planned our way out. It was ter the most frightening thing I've ever done. 
um, you know, one, and I think this is fairly universal for people getting out of cults, so I've distilled into three principles, which are three kinds yeah. of things that you're frightened of, which I think many people feel. You're frightened of the, that the leaders of the group's going to come and get you. So you're right. frightened of retribution, so you yeah. just have a physical fear they're going to come and get you. Um, you're, it, it's a, you have what I call, I can't remember the second one now, I think the worst bit for me was what I call existential fear. You feel like you're about to walk off the edge of the known world into mm. a black void. And it's very hard to describe to anyone who hasn't been there. But it's, a f you've been made to feel that the rest of the world is terrible, that there's nothing out there. You're, you always get this kind of <clears throat> curse, like if you leave, you're going to become a prostitute or a drug addict or you're going to die of cancer. All cults have that. So even if you're not consciously thinking that, mm. you just feel this intense fear about what's going to happen if I leave. Um, and you just fear how are you going to restart life? Because your whole life, your job, often <clears throat> all the people you know, your housing, you know, everything is based there. So to leave, you have to, you know, I was 36, I had to start life again from mm. scratch. You lose a lot of life skills, I suppose. Plus, you've lost, in my case, 10 years of any kind of... I mean, I had life skills, sort of. I didn't know how to choose a shirt when I went shopping. I mean, your decision-making is completely screwed up. Yeah. Um, you don't know what your meaning in life is. Yeah. Um, I was lucky, which I didn't come out totally broke, and I did have a career, not one I wanted... But it was a use. It was a career that I could earn money at, whereas a lot of people come out totally broke. But you're building your life from scratch, having lost all these years. Um, so it's an exquisitely difficult thing to do. But wow, it's also wonderful because, oh, I can. Hey, it's a sunny day. I could go and have a walk in the sun. Yeah. Wow. Little things. <laughs> you know, and I remember kind of seeing, like, the lilacs, because I got out in spring, and just, like, I'd go up and smell the lilac, and it was a really magical thing, because I kind of literally not had time or mental space to do something like that for ten years. So I just kind of inhaled some of the beauty of the world, mm. and it, that was a very moving part of it. And being able to hang out with friends and we would do normal things do normal things have a beer eat nice food not work two jobs all the time and i was lucky when i got out that there was a group of us who got out together and we found other ex-members from years previous mm. and every wednesday night we would sit around and eat and drink and tell the stories to try to understand what had which is what this very very was. helpful isn't it it was our recovery yeah. And it was fantastic and a lot of fun. I mean, there were tears, but there was also a lot of laughing. Mm -hmm. So it was a, that part was a rich experience. Yeah. Great. So, <laughs> so Alex, what, what are the main identifiers of a cult that you've discovered? So here's what the way I look at it. And I, this isn't just my thinking. I've drawn on the work of some of the important scholars in the field, like Robert J. Lifton and Margaret Singer, and someone who's not necessarily known in the field but really is brilliant which is Hannah Arendt who looked at Nazi Germany and she so it's all the same thing anyway um, the way I look at how to define a cult it may be different than what are the warning signs those are kind of two different things because the warning signs are really what you see from the outside mm. and you don't see the whole thing from the outside um, but I'll talk about the definition. So cults have a charismatic and authoritarian leadership. Now often it's just one leader. So, you know, Charlie Manson was obviously charismatic. He found a way to draw in people, but he was authoritarian in that he was a bully. He was clearly extremely violent. And that mixture of the drawing in charismatic ability with the to frighten and terrorize people 
I think is a kind of psychological mix that makes a cult leader. Now some of the bigger cults that have been around for a while may, like Scientology <clears throat> had L. Ron Hubbard who fit that profile and when he died David Miscavige was ready to step in. Yeah. Um, some of the other ones like the Exclusive Brethren or the Jehovah's Witness, I think they don't any longer have a single dominant leader, I think other people have more expertise in those groups than I do. But I think what happens is that the governing bodies and the leadership bodies of those groups kind of carry those qualities with them um, of the charisma and the authoritarianism. So they kind of, it carries yeah. through to that executive body somehow. But that's sort of an open and interesting question that I mm. wish somebody would study and Well, clarify. perhaps like the, the seven or eight men in the governing body and a similar group in uh, the Mormon, it's, it's almost it's, it's like a single individual in a way. They, they act and think as one in a, in a sense. Well, that's what I'd like to understand. And again, I think yeah. that's, you know, for if anyone's watching this and wants to study, you know, I, which I really encourage people, we need more scholars in the field. Yeah. Um, that, that's a very interesting question that I've had in my mind for a long time. So yeah. um, one of the things I've learned to say post-cult is, you know, I don't know. I think it's like this, but I'm not sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a wonderful thing to be able to say that. So that's the leadership has those two qualities. Then the structure, as we all know, is, you know, high, very steeply hierarchical, um, very isolating, you know, if you're in, you're in, and outside world as the devil. Um, the larger cults have a kind of lieutenant layer at the top, um, which is very unstable because the leadership has to keep promoting and demoting that layer so they don't challenge the leadership because if they get too mm. comfortable, they might, you know, resist. So it's a, you have a lot of power as a lieutenant, but it's not certain power. <laughs> that makes sense. Yeah. And then in the bigger groups you have front groups. So like Scientology has Narconon and its various management trainings and all this kind of stuff. Which is a way to get new members in and to get money in and to... It's a kind of what Hannah Arendt calls their transmission belts from the outside world to the inner world of the cult. Uh, the Moonies famously have had, I mean I think it's probably up into the thousands of front groups of different kinds. Wow. Um, importantly, what people don't understand about this structure, people, the stereotype of a cult is once people join cults because they need to belong. Well, you know, everyone wants to belong, so that's not very helpful. Unless you're a hermit living in the mountains, but, you know, human nature is we want to be part of, be together with other humans. Yeah, yeah. So the stereotype is everyone joins because they all need to belong, and then they have these, you know, really close relationships, and mm. they feel all comradely and wonderful. Well, the fact is you're completely isolated in a cult, even from your fellow members. You're, you're not, and it's a peculiar thing, it's what I call, it's a kind of hybrid relationship. You're not isolated in a way because you're always going to church, or doing your meetings, or you're with them all the time. Yeah. In fact, with the Mormons, I think the JWs and many other groups, Heaven's Gate, you may even be assigned a, part, a buddy. So mm. you have someone always with you. So uh, the Mormon, um, when they go on their two year missions overseas, yeah, they have a, what's he called? It's not the account, accountable. Uh, I've forgotten Something the name. Something like that, They've yeah. have got a name. <laughs> But when the two two missionaries go out, yeah. yeah, they're always they always have to be within so many feet of each other. And the only time they cannot be in the same immediate vicinity is when they're in the bathroom, thanks, <laughs> <laughs> or when they're talking to their senior minister. Otherwise, yeah. for two years they have to be locked on to the other person. Mm. So. Okay, you can call that comradeship, or you can call that a complete invasion of privacy, which is that's one watching them. the other to make sure that they yeah. do what is expected. Yeah. And these are people who don't know each other; so they're not friends. Who you know, they're strangers when they first get together. A lot of cults do that. So, so you have you know these um, what in Heaven's Gate was called a check partner, I think, or a buddy system, or whatever they're called. 
But instead of that being a, a real closeness, what it is, it's a kind of monitoring each other closeness. And in fact, and in my study that I did of this American political cult, I really tried to get at what was the particular nature of these, not just the Czech partners, but all the internal relationships in a cult. And they're very close in that these are people you can call on if you have a flat tire and you can't go and do your cult work. They will come in the middle of the night. Mm. You can, anything that's going to interfere with your being a good cultist, they're ready and there for you. What they won't do, as I talked about before, is you can't share doubts. That is absolutely forbidden. So you're isolated in terms of your own trying to understand this world you're in. You have nobody to talk to about that, including possibly your husband or your closest people, mm. your parents. You cannot share doubts. Um, also, often, not always, but if you're sick, you know, if you're not being useful to the cult, then that support may not be there. I mean, some, that depends on the cult a little bit. Um, so they're just kind of odd relationships, but they are psychologically isolating. Because normally in life, we're trying to understand our worlds. We understand our worlds by talking to those around us. That's how humans learn. But there, you can't do that. The only thing you can really allow to talk to the other people about is the cult talk. You know, have I transformed myself adequately this week? If not, I'll do my self-criticism with you. You know, that's the kind of thing you're allowed to say. And you're not necessarily allowed to say, what a beautiful day it is, let's go to the beach. Mm. So it's a very limited, controlled relationship. And it's horrible, and it's very lonely. So I believe that people in cults are actually very lonely, as opposed to feeling close and calm. Of course, initially there's, there's the, the welcome and the love bombing. Yes, yeah, so at the beginning you get love bombed that's in most cults, not all. So, yeah. Well, it may even still continue, but it's 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 cult love bombing. It's just you know if you're doing what Jesus tells you, then you're going to get the love, and it's, if you don't, watch out. Yeah. You know. So that's the structure. Really quickly, then the you have the ideology, which is the belief system. A lot of people, I think, get very distracted by trying to look at the ideology and like, oh, how are we going to understand what JWs think? Or, mm. I'm not that interested, to be honest. <laughs> what, I, what I think is important about the ideology is how it reflects the structure and the leader. All cult ideologies have certain features. You must believe exactly this and nothing else. So it's a very, it's, that rig, it's a rigid either-or ideology. It's not open to it. Let's have some different views about things. It is a, like you're saying with a triangle. It's, it's a top down. Exactly. Yeah. So it really mirrors the structure. Um, it, it justifies the power of the leader. So all these ideologies will justify why you have to listen to the leader and nobody else. And also, it doesn't reflect the reality. So I, I sort of believe in reality. <laughs> Yeah. And I believe we can talk about it and kind of try to understand it by really describing it. Well, cult ideologies sort of by nature can't reflect the reality. Because if they did, they would reflect a miserable and crazy existence. So they're all what Hannah Arendt would call fictitious. They all describe a kind of fictitious world. So I think that's what's interesting to look at in the ideology. Okay, fourth point, we're getting there is I believe they all engage in what we can call undue influence, coercive persuasion, brainwashing, mind control, thought reform. There's a load of different names. It's all the same thing. And that's, to me, basically a process where you're, diso you're exhausting and you're confusing and you're doing all these different things so that people aren't in a state where they can think clearly. They're basically dissociated. Mm. And so... If they can't think clearly about what's happening, the group can pour its fictitious ideology into their brain yeah. as a way for them to have some thoughts about what they're doing. So that's a kind of complicated topic, but they all engage in some form of what I call brainwashing. And the fifth point is the outcome is you have exploited and controllable followers who you can now tell what to do. Mm. Bob's your uncle. And not... And, the cult leaders aren't generally telling those people what to do so that they have happier lives. They're telling them what to do so the cult leader maintains control and 
gets what their needs. Are. It's almost like it's something which these different cults um, seem to know this structure, into, you know, almost instinctively. It's mm -hmm. not as if they've read a book on how to, mm -hmm. you know, create a cult. Some have read the book. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's it, it is interesting. Some have read the book. So um, the, the cult that Dr. La Yanya Lalich, who's a really important scholar in this field, the one she was in, the Democratic Workers' Party. The yes. leader was a woman sociology professor, yeah. I think at the University of Chicago. And she read the book on brainwashing, Robert J. Lifton's book. And she, I think she knew exactly what she was doing. Now, you have to have the personality that wants to do that. I mean, I know a lot about brainwashing, but sadly, I don't have enough authoritarianism nor charisma to really, you know, have that drive. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> But some, I think, learn it. They go through other groups. They kind of graduate through other groups and take, pick up tricks. And some, I think, do have it just instinctively because it's something that psychopaths, and I believe the leaders are psychopaths, yeah. um, it comes with that personality. You, you know instinctively how to control people, and this is the way you control people. It's basically isolate people. And then engulf them in your system and then frighten the bejesus out of them. And hey, give that a try. You'll be surprised at the results. <laughs> <laughs> Which brings me on to the, our friends, the Jehovah's Witnesses. Um, so the most popular uploads on Talk Beliefs are my conversations with Jehovah's Witnesses out on the street. Uh, there are a lot of ex-JWs who find it very therapeutic to listen to active members of the church being asked difficult and controversial mm. questions. Mm. Um, now, would you put the JWs in the category of a dangerous cult or simply a mainstream religion with very individual ideas and practices? I think there's enough evidence to say they're a dangerous cult. I, I want to say I'm not an expert in that group. Um, however, I have been meeting some marvellous ex-JWs. I mean, I'm, I have to say I'm very excited because there seems to be quite a dynamic movement of exes coming out now and finding each other courtesy of the internet and they are a big group so I'm kind of excited about that because I think that's going to help the general cause of um, cult awareness that a lot of people are coming out and talking about it. Uh, dangerous, I think the obvious way they're dangerous is the whole um, thing about blood transfusions and the various things about that and the deaths that have been caused yeah. completely unnecessarily and this is a um, belief a set of protocols that seem to change as the leadership decides randomly. You know, it's not based in anything rational or sensible, and children are dying and so forth. Like many of these closed groups, and not just cults, but other kinds of institutions, there's a lot of child sexual abuse. The two witness rule is particularly absolutely disgusting. I only learned about it, you know, last year sometime, and I was horrified and also amazed the cults the things that cults come up with you know i've been studying them for 25 years and they still they never cease to surprise me and the two witness rule and they bounce back from it despite yeah it's horrible any controversy so i'm again happy to say you know there's some legal cases that are being won right now on that yeah um, australia mm. so this you know and again the two witness rule is just a way to isolate people and keep things secret and uh, from the outside world and you know, we can't just say, oh, this is a quaint little religion, you know, let's not interfere with their practices. No, you know, doctors, social workers, teachers have to actually, when they see anything, you know, try to break open this thing, go in, go and look after those children. Yeah. Because no one is there to able to protect them who's within the group. They they may want to protect them, but they're not able to because of the power structures in the group. And it's people from the outside really have to take this seriously. Same thing is happening with these Orthodox Jewish groups. I'm starting to get calls from people who are either out or want to be out. I'm talking about the extreme Orthodox Jewish groups, not yes. you know, not the main, more mainstream ones, but the very closed ones where the kids don't go to schools that are publicly accountable. And there's a lot of these abuse stories coming out. So you know, we have to shine some light on this for these kids really I'm passionate about it yeah absolutely. Help, you know yeah
Right. And you offer a cult recovery counselling. Uh, so can you talk a little bit about what this entails? Is it basically like an inter intervention, like when someone is pulled out of a cult? or? No, the intervention of trying to help people out of cults is there are some people who do that. And um, you know, if anyone is concerned about that, they can contact me. I can potentially put them in touch. <clears throat> um, that's a quite a different and very difficult thing, but uh, and it's not something I do. Hmm. Um, I mean, I've been involved in a couple of cases, but it's the main th thing I do is recovery counselling and education, and it's not therapy. I mean, there's a kind of therapeutic component in that I listen carefully to people's stories. Um, but people, it's not a long-term thing. People may see me once, twice. Probably nobody's come more than eight times. And what it, it's a process of uh, what's called psychoeducation. So in other words, I teach about cults on a one-on-one -on -one basis, or sometimes one on, sometimes more than one person at a time, depending on the situation. And then the person together, we kind of try to map the person's experience to what we know about cults yeah. and that's incredibly helpful to people it just helps them you know people come out of a cult knowing something's wrong their heads spinning there's also some post-traumatic stress well a lot going on and it's making sense of the experience and developing what we i call a coherent narrative so that you can actually tell the story of what happened yeah. is incredibly empowering and helpful to people. Um, so I do that by talking about their story, talking about cults. We try to map those together, see how it fits. So I have had a couple people come, but then it turns out they weren't in a cult. They may, you know, but mostly people don't, they mostly realize there's something cultic about what's happened. Um, so, and then also I provide a lot of resources things to read, videos to watch, yeah. that people will do on their own time. And in fact, that's a lot of what I do is send people to appropriate resources so they can kind of do plenty of study and homework hmm. on their own, okay. which is also very helpful. So. Alex, you're an advocate for prevention, that is identifying cult organizations as well as the signs that someone might be seduced into a cult. So what could schools, governments, local communities and the media do to help? Yeah, I'm really keen on this, and again, you know, I've um, been working on this for a long time, and I hope we're making progress, but very slowly. Um, I think what's needed is really a public health campaign. Mm -hmm. So it really affects all areas of the population. So we're going with young people, students, but also medical professionals, legal professionals, social work folks, and so forth. Um, it's not that complicated. I think we can teach the basics, what I just talked about. Mm. What are the five definitional things of a cult? Or some version of that. There are different people have different versions. We're all trying to say the same thing. Yes, yes. And then we need to teach something about the warning signs. You know, if someone tries to isolate you, you know, tell you your family is no good, uh, your friends are no good. If somebody starts getting you, you know, massively busy only in their thing and you're not you give up all your hobbies and you don't have time to do anything else changes in behavior yeah 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 um and you know there's a list of warning signs on my website and there's various you can google you know warning signs of cults there's plenty of lists out there um it's not rocket science to teach this stuff also since world war ii there have been 70 years of scholarship because the nazi regime and stalin's regime were cultic in nature, as is North Korea, as was Chairman Mao's China. People have done a lot of studies on this, and that's what I teach, actually. I think you're interested in my class that I'm teaching. Yeah. I teach a lot of the basics of this in my class at the Mary Ward Adult Education Centre in central London. Um, and people just find it absolutely fascinating. And it's helpful in all kinds of parts of life about when someone's trying to con you, or you know, do a sales pitch on you that you don't want to be involved with, how to walk away from a situation, hmm. not just follow the social norms, oh, I'm supposed to be polite to this person, but if instead if you feel in any way uncomfortable, you can learn, hey, it's okay, it's actually healthy for me to just walk away. 
people even yabbering mm. at themselves. You know, there's all these things that we can teach people that are ways they can protect themselves from uh, these situations of inappropriate yeah. power relations and influence. And I just think we need to be getting on it. And it completely relates to the problems with terrorism and all the terrible recruitment of youngsters we're seeing um, into groups like ISIS and related groups and the right-wing groups as well. You know, I, I truly believe if we teach people what the actual outcomes of these things are before they get in, while they're still able to think clearly, we would go a long way in the society. And interestingly, in Germany, after World War II, German education was made to teach about totalitarianism to all its um, high school kids. That was part of the kind of peace negotiations. And I think there's quite a lot of that still going on in Germany. But here we don't do it. We teach tolerance and all these kind of things. Tolerance is great, but it's not teaching us the, the, the kind of relational effect of someone who's trying to gain power over us yeah. and how that works. That's the piece that we need to teach, and we can. So for a school, for the younger kids, it could be part of what, what, I, what I used to call social studies class. Perhaps that could yes. be part of that. Yeah, and I think it or, could go in two different places in English education. Yeah. Citizenship education mm -hmm. and personal, social, and health, PSHE think it's personal social health education hmm. um, you know they're teaching now that I think it's now legally statutory this stuff about consent to young young people you know yeah. sexual consent that's a perfect place to teach this stuff because it really relates you know how do you look after your boundaries hmm. <laughs> you know your own autonomy uh, when approached by someone who's trying to invade that so, you know, we've got the place to teach it, we have the knowledge, but we need a campaign by hopefully some of our, these ex-members to yeah. go to our schools, go to our universities, go to our politicians and start pushing to get this as a public health campaign. Right. And of course, you'll be, you'll be teaching a course on cults and totalitarianism at the Mary Ward Centre in central London uh, next month. That'll be September. I'm starting, yeah, it's, that's a daytime course, 1.30 to 3.30, starting September 24th for 12 sessions. Then I'm teaching in, starting in January at the same place, an evening course. I think it's 6 to 8, the yeah. same course. Um, it's a great course. I often have quite a few ex-cult members or people who've had some relationship to cults. And then also just people who have, at least they think they've had, oh, this is what's interesting, they think they've had no relationship to cults. And as the course goes on, I tell you, nearly everyone the course finally goes, oh, you know, I was in this group when I was young, or, oh, my auntie sort of disappeared. You know, they sort yeah. of connect. And this is something that's not understood, the prevalence of these groups is far greater than we un than we know. Yeah. Or the kid in the back of the class who was a JW and it, wouldn't yeah, uh, exactly. you know, have the Halloween party. Exactly. Now you have a context in which to understand that behavior. Yeah. Um, so I think you know, there are many, many cults that are all over. Everyone has had some run-in. We just don't always know that. But if once you learn what they look like and some of these warning signs, you kind of go through the world mm. with a different pair of spectacles on. Which is interesting. And of course, all the information for this and your works will be on alexandrastein.com, yes. which is your website. Yeah. And we'll have a link to that in the show notes, right. as well as other links as well to your work. Right. And uh, in fact, your forthcoming book is called Terror and Love, The Role of Attachment in Brainwashing. Um, could you tell, tell people where to find it? And um, also a little bit about your, your previous uh, publications. Yes. Um, the forthcoming book isn't yet published. It may be a while. It is based on my PhD research. Um, that is available. It's a little bit of a chunky read, uh, but bits of it are, are readable. So if you're interested in, in that, you can find that on my web, through my web page. Um, you'll have to wait for the other book. But I've written quite a bit about my approach, and my approach is, is very much about looking, it's important to look at our close relationships and it's how those close relationships are manipulated that is really the essence of the cultic bond. And so it's a little different view than some people have 
had. It's an addition. I mean, there's been some a lot of good work about cults, so I'm not saying mine is the best. It's just I'm adding something, sure, yeah. which is to say we really need to examine these close relationships and the fact that what happens is instead of being allowed close relationships, now the only close relationships that's allowed is to the leader or the cult. And that's really a defamation, a deformity in terms of how human beings operate. Really, we need to be having our close relationships with our families and our friends, and that's what's healthy, not to a group, to an organization, or to somebody who doesn't have our best interests in mind, <coughs> Excuse me, at heart. And it's something that's termed disorganized attachment in the attachment literature, and that's a very interesting literature, but people can Google that. That's a whole topic of, of study. Um, that's the lens I look at this stuff through. Yeah. Uh, uh, but you can find information about that and some of I've written some shorter articles about that that are on my website um, and you can also see a link to my previous book which is really a memoir with the story of my experience which I again when people come out of cults the ones not everyone but the ones who kind of want to understand it usually what I find happens is the first thing we have to do is tell our own story yeah. we have to understand it now, once you've told your own story, then you kind of want to help other people and maybe back off and get a more general sense. And that's kind of what happened with me once I then want to study it and really understand it. And so I studied a different cult. And anyway, um, and then have been working in the field since then. So. Right. Thank you very much, Alexandra, okay. for Thank talking you. to us uh, to Talk Beliefs. And we all look forward to Terror and Love coming out uh, <laughs> Soon? Is it this year or next year? Uh, I don't um, know yet. We'll, we're <laughs> going to have to watch this space. Hopefully Excellent. not too long. Okay. So. Thank you very much for the work okay. you're doing as well. It's Thanks. very important. Thank you. Okay. So thank is you. yours. Thank you very much. <laughs>